Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the CCA Cinematheque. Uh, my name is Jason Silverman. It's always a great honor to have David Barsami on with us. Uh, he's is he here? <laughs> he is here. And David and I met uh, when I was running the Taos Talking Picture Festival. Uh, we had the idea that uh, what you consume in terms of media uh, impacts you in a great way. Kind of you are what you watch. Uh, and we built uh, an entire event around that called the Media Forum. And uh, we went into it naively. Uh, wide-eyed, and David was a mentor right from the beginning and kind of told us who was who and what was what and, and uh, helped us get our story straight, and then made a series of great presentations there, also disseminated some of our great presentations out into the world through Alternative Radio. Happy birthday, Alternative Radio. It's now 25 years old. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, since in those intervening 16 years, um, David increasingly has become not just a journalist, but a forceful spokesperson in his own right, uh, uh, traveling the world and bringing back stories, um, collaborating with some of the world's great thinkers, uh, writing books, uh, telling his own kind of stories. And so we figured tonight it would be a great opportunity to talk and have him let us know how he sees current affairs. So we've set up a little game here called the David Barsamian Speed Round. So we're going to ask a few questions to talk about current events, uh, and then we'll have you guys jump in, and we'll talk some more. Uh, it's a great honor to have my friend and a hero, David Barsamian. Question one. Censorship in oh. India. Censorship in India. Well, you may know that on uh, September 23rd, I arrived at Indira Gandhi International Airport in New Delhi, as I've had many, many times. Uh, and I was immediately pulled to the side by an immigration officer who said, uh, uh, can you come with me? These are always very scary words at, at an airport. And uh, I was kept in a room uh, without uh, any uh, recourse to know what was going on. And finally, an immigration officer came to me and said, uh, you know, you're going back on the same plane that you arrived in. Uh, and I said, well, what's the reason? He said, we don't know. We, we ourselves do not know. He waved a piece of paper in front of me, uh, which I could see had the Lufthansa flight, my name, and the word banned uh, on it. Uh, and he said, you're going back and on, on the same flight that you came in on. I said, but I have a valid visa. I have a multiple entry visa uh, for India. That, that is still valid, you know, so you're not honoring your own visa. He said, contact uh, the Indian Embassy in your country. That was the constant uh, refrain. So it was a very um, uh, bizarre, Kafka-esque type of situation. Uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, you also get to pay for your own deportation. Uh, so it became very expensive as well. And uh, now uh, a group of uh, Activists in India, including Arundhati Roy, Vandana Shiva, documentary filmmakers like Sanjay Kak, uh, well-known economists like uh, Amit Baduri, uh, human rights activists Aruna Roy, and others, like a who's who of the Indian um, social uh, society uh, conscience, have signed a petition, have submitted it to the government to reverse this ban. But the thing is, when, when you're dealing with faceless bureaucracies, they themselves did not know, the Indians themselves did not know who to submit this paper to. Because this, is, this was a decision, a decision made in secret by the uh, Ministry of the Interior, which is in charge of uh, internal security. So we don't know what I'm being accused of, nor do we know who our accuser or accusers are uh, in this particular case. So, uh, I'm a little bit pessimistic and quite frankly very worried because uh, someone I know last November, almost a year ago now, Richard Shapiro, <coughs> who has been very active on the Kashmir issue and his wife, who's an Indian national, Angana Chatterjee, is herself uh, one of the most prominent activists on the issue of uh, Kashmir. He was denied entry into India very much as I was. A year later, almost to the day, uh, he still has no explanation. Earlier in September, a, a human rights activist from the Philippines, um, Akina May, 
uh, was denied access uh, into uh, India. So more and more, we're seeing, just like what's going on here in Albuquerque and in Denver, airports and immigration departments are being mm -hmm. used as weapons to stifle dissent. Mm -hmm. is, it, is there a free press in India? There's a, a, a lively press, print press in India. There isn't the community and uh, public access TV, radio, uh, that we have here in the United States. So there, there really is nothing equivalent to KUNM or KSFR for that, for that matter. But uh, the print is rather lively and uh, extensively covered. Uh, in some instances, it was on the front page, uh, <coughs> probably a slow news day. But I have a, you know, I've been going to India, you, you, you don't know, I shouldn't say you know. Uh, I've been going to India since 1966. So I've, you know, I've spent lots of time there, I have lots of friends, and uh, so it was heartening to see this mushrooming of support uh, to reverse uh, this deportation ban. But what's going to happen is, is not clear at all. India's, India, like the United States, is using, the way the U.S. uses 9-11, India uses its own internal security scares to repress dissent particularly on the issue of Kashmir. Kashmir is to India what Tibet is to China. As soon as you say the word, they go ballistic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, it's, it, people become incredibly irrational on the issue of, of Kashmir. It goes right to the solar plexus of Indian identity, what the Indian state is. Because one of India's great, you know, triumphal kind of slogans is that is, you know, it has the second largest or third largest Muslim population in the world. Uh, Kashmir, the state of Jammu and Kashmir is Muslim majority. You know, the people are happy living uh, within India, which just masks over uh, an incredible record of, of human rights abuses that would put some of the Central American republics uh, to shame. Tens of thousands of Kashmiris have been killed. The, the official number is 70,000. Many more have been wounded. Eight to 10,000 have disappeared. And again, resonating with what happened in Central America and Latin America in the 1970s and 80s, you have all of these people that have simply vanished. They've been picked up by the state security forces and are disappeared. And so uh, there's a phenomenon uh, that I discovered when I was in Kashmir last February, and that is half widow. Half widow, I was like, what does that mean? A half widow is someone who claims that a brother or an uncle or a father or a husband is missing, but because there's no definitive proof of death, is not entitled to any pension or benefit or any kind of government assistance. So they're in this, uh, twilight zone of being a half widow and there's no of course a resolution the other word uh, term i learned recently in india is custodial deaths um, and i wondered what what does that mean you know like half widow a custodial death is when state security forces arrest someone and the, that person it dies in custody hmm. while being held by the state security so, forces and uh, India ranks number one in the world in custodial deaths. So not China, not Syria, not Gaddafi's mm. Libya, not Mubarak's Egypt, but the world's largest democracy, uh, India, ranks number one in custodial deaths. So there's, there's a huge number of uh, internal issues uh, in India that's, that's coming to the fore now, and the government is desperately uh, trying to put the lid on any kind of discussion, any kind of, um, uh, you know, shining the light on these dark areas. Since there's no international coverage of it, one independent journalist with a, you know, 20 bucks in his pocket from Boulder can scare them. It, it's, uh, it's, it's curious, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to flatter myself in terms of, you know, thinking I'm, I'm very important, but that the Indian government is spending its time, uh, you know, focusing on someone like me, and then having this huge brouhaha explode in their face in the Indian media uh, itself is, uh, is I think, uh, rather telling. Yeah, that's amazing. Question two, WikiLeaks. So we read today that they're running out of money and they might have to close up operations. WikiLeaks running out of money and may have to close uh, its operations. Well, I think WikiLeaks is one of the most uh, remarkable interventions for freedom and democracy 
in memory, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say in history, but certainly in living memory. It dwarfs the, the, uh, what, the Pentagon Papers that Dan Ellsberg uh, released because it implicates so many regimes. The Pentagon Papers was exclusively about uh, the workings, the inner workings and criminal activities of the Nixon administration. Uh, the WikiLeaks documents uh, covers the world, literally, from Australia to India and Pakistan to uh, Syria to Egypt uh, to the United States as well. And I've been calling for Obama to give up his Nobel Prize, which he never should have gotten. What a farce that was. And he should give it to WikiLeaks. They could use the money, and they've certainly earned the honor. Why are they running out of money? They're running out of money because of the tremendous efforts of Eric Holder and what I call the Department of Injustice uh, here in the United States to prevent anyone from uh, wiring money to WikiLeaks. So uh, PayPal and all of these internet accesses that WikiLeaks had to generate income before have all been shut down on threat of prosecution. Uh, you know, when the federal government uh, calls you up when the attorney general you know, threatens you with indictments, it's very, very intimidating. And these organizations you know, want to play ball with, with Uncle Sam uh, and back off. And so WikiLeaks is, is in a precarious situation right now. But I think the work it has done is uh, truly um, exemplary and it's inspiring. And we should all you know, thank our stars that a handful of people decided to break this omerta. You know, we all think omerta, that's just a mafia term, right? But it also applies to uh, foreign policy and domestic policy of powerful states. They, they impose a code of silence on the media, on the corporate sector, not to speak about certain issues, not to speak about the massive deportations that are going on, the massive violations of uh, human rights car being carried out by Eric Holder and the Obama administration. What did, what did you, did you just have your beliefs reinforced and you learned something new from, from the material? Well, it was interesting to see in print the, uh, the, what the US was saying publicly and then what they were saying among themselves. And it, there was a huge night and day difference there in terms of, uh, of perception, in terms of of information, uh, re, you know, they were talking about uh, the Karzai regime, the puppet regime in Kabul, the puppet regime of Zardari and Gilani in Islamabad, uh, in public saying they're great stalwart allies, we're all together in the, you know, the war against terror, yada, 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 and in their, in their internal communications, they're saying these guys are, you know, they're a bunch of clowns, they're corrupt, they're, they're nepotistic, uh, they're tyrannical, they're, you know, they're the exact opposite of the kinds, kind of governments uh, that we should be uh, supporting. So you see that, that dichotomy between what s states say in public and what they communicate internally. Mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street, one of the most uh, exciting movements uh, literally since the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, it has mushroomed from literally nowhere. But of course, that's maybe part of the uh, media spin, that it came out of nowhere. But it has its roots in our political and economic culture, which has basically collapsed. You know, we have two ruling parties. One is the party of the billionaires, the other the party of the millionaires. Pick your poison, cyanide or, or uh, arsenic. You know, I prefer arsenic, it takes a little longer, so you get a few extra days, you know, cyanide is like right away. But those are the kinds of political choices that we have. Uh, corporate media that is now beyond parody. You know, when um, Nixon got the Nobel Peace Prize, I mean, which in itself was a huge crime, uh, in the 1970s, Tom Paxton uh, lamented, a great folk singer of the time, he said, what will I sing about? You can, parody has just died. When someone like Henry Kissinger, a certified war criminal, receives the Peace Prize, uh, it is the end of something. And so uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement is uh, very inspiring and it speaks to the deep discontent 
and anger in the society. And um, I have, you know, here from uh, our, our bolder paper, you know, polls, 37% support the Wall Street movement, anger gro growing. Gee, I wonder why anger is growing. 25 million people are either, either out of work or don't have a full-time job. Seven million people have lost their homes. Millions of others uh, are facing foreclosure. I mean, why would they be angry? Tuition prices are skyrocketing all over the country. Once inexpensive public universities, I don't know about the University of New Mexico, but in California and Co Colorado that I do know about, uh, tuition is skyrocketing, indebting students and their parents for the rest of their lives. Uh, it has just come out in the last couple of days that student debt now exceeds credit card debt, which is, I mean, stunning when you think about it. It is in excess of a trillion dollars, and that number is just increasing constantly. So there is a tremendous amount of anger. Now, how have, the, how have our great, how has the great free press covered the <coughs> Occupy Wall Street movement? Because that, that in itself uh, is a story. Well, first is the, the classic pattern. First, you pretend they're not there. So week goes by, 10 days goes, goes by. I think National Public Radio, you know, that left liberal uh, radio network, uh, had its first coverage nine days into Occupy Wall Street. And then the other media started following suit. What was the coverage like? Demonization and dismissal. Tired hippies, you know, old school people, out of work, uh, you know, looking to smoke some weed, uh, having rock and roll. Uh, Woodstock was mentioned a number of times as, as if there's some connection hmm. between a, a rock festival in upstate New York that was held in 1969 and what was going on uh, in uh, Wall Street. And then, you know, th then the, uh, the movement was denounced for not being focused. It didn't have an agenda. It didn't have leaders. Uh, it, did, it didn't have a message uh, that was clear and coherent. Now, here's, this is an interesting thing, because here's where the corporate media get you with a left and a right. If they did have those things, I can say with confidence, they then would have been denounced as Leninist, as Stalinist, as top-down, hierarchical, and, uh, no, uh, and non-democratic, undemocratic. So they, you know, they have it both ways. That's, that's what happens when you have, not journalists, but when you have stenographers, you know, lapdogs with laptops, that are, that are not doing anything that even resembles journalism. This is not really, this is not journalism that's being practiced. It is a form of stenography wedded to state power. So th that, that has been a constant theme now, but the movement has grown to such an extent that the corporate media cannot, cannot ignore it. Now, the New York Times had a very fallacious article that's almost redundant, New York Times and fallacies, but a very, an extremely fallacious article the other day uh, where it said that the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Denver, Occupy Santa Fe, Occupy Albuquerque are virtually identical you know, in its dislike for a big government. Okay, so maybe there, but there is a fundamental difference between the two. The Tea Party was funded by the Koch brothers. Most of those spontaneous meetings and rallies where people were bussed in were paid for by these billionaire oil magnets, uh, David and Charles Koch. So there's no resemblance between this grass movement, grassroots movement of uh, Occupy Wall Street, and I spoke at Occupy Denver uh, just a couple of days ago. There was, you know, a huge turnout there. Uh, this movement is growing. They are not parallel, uh, and I think it's, you know, very misleading to uh, make those kinds of uh, comparisons. But that's the newspaper of record. That's our best single source of uh, of information uh, in the mainstream, as it were. Of course. You can go to Democracy Now!, Alternative Radio, Z Magazine, and, and other sources. Uh, Occupy Wall Street itself has now its own newspaper called the Occupy Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Not owned by Rupert Murdoch, but owned by the people in, and put out by the people right there. And I must say, the production values are, are very high. There's, you know, it's multicolored. Uh, and it's, it's very well done. This particular issue uh, has a timeline of when the movement started on uh, September 17th. But let me go back to another 17th, if, if you'll indulge me for a moment. December 17th, 2010, what happened? 
a poor street vendor in Tunisia, in the town of um, Boui Said, was humiliated once again by a government bureaucrat for not having proper licenses and papers, and killed himself in frustration. That ignited, that was the ember that you know, led to a spark, that led to a prairie fire that resulted in the Tunisian Revolution, which then spilled over into uh, Egypt, into other countries, dictators long supported by the United States, including Ben Ali in uh, Tunisia and Mubarak uh, for 30 years in the US uh, pocket, the longest running ruler of Egypt since Ramses II. <laughs> And, you know, these people in Washington, they must think we're really stupid or, and, and moronic. I mean, the lack of respect they have for us. Hillary Clinton, during this upheaval going on in Egypt, which started on January 17th and ended on February 13th, she had the temerity to tell the American people that no country in the world has done more for Egyptian democracy than the United States of America. That's an exact quote. I mean, you know, there's a word for that. That's chutzpah. I mean, that's, you know, th that is nerve on a monumental scale because we have fortified this autocratic, tyrannical regime uh, in Egypt for 30 years. The exact opposite. But in the, in, the, in the USA, in the United States of Amnesia, where there is no media to remind people what the history is, since we also have no history, you know, we're all worried about, you know, is Michael Jackson's doctor going to get convicted? And uh, you know this kidnapped baby in Kansas or Florida or wh wherever it is. So we have you know, all these weapons of mass distraction, and there's n there's no knowledge. There's no knowledge of history. There's no understanding of the past. And without an understanding of the past, how can you understand the present or even have some inkling of what's going to come uh, in the future? So all of these things are interlocked together. What happened in, in Tunisia in uh, December of uh, 2010? Wall Street, the movement here in the United States, and the general global rebellion against the neoliberal agenda, which has allowed for privatization, which has allowed for uh, banks to be freed from any kind of uh, regulation. But the other thing I want to uh, mention, and I, I know I'm going a mile a minute here, <laughs> is that the whole issue of what I call rotten apples and the barrel. The en entire focus, even in the left liberal press, is on the rotten apples in the barrel. That is to say, it's Raj Rajaratnam, who just got 11 years for insider trading. He's a big uh, hedge funds operator in New York. Uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, and before that it was Ken Lay of Enron. Before that, for people who remember, Ivan Bosky and Mil uh, Michael Milken and junk bonds. You know, it's all about these nefarious characters who uh, invent these, uh, you know, uh, elaborate Ponzi schemes and rip off the public. What's excluded from scrutiny is the barrel that produces these apples. So might we look at the barrel that produces these apples and call it by its name? Not the free market. It's not a free market. It's, it is capitalism, but a very particular kind of capitalism where the state is in cahoots with private corporations. So as Occupy Wall Street, one of the banners is, you know, a bailout of the banks, but not of the people. And so that whole issue of we need to focus on capitalism as a failed economic system. This is not just episodic. This is happening more and more often, these booms and busts. What is it about this system that loots the earth of its resources, that is destroying the environment, all in the quest of more and more profits, that privileges pe profits over people? We need to rethink that equation. Because people are more important than profits. Life is more important than profits, and the environment is more, impo more important uh, than profits. And there are huge issues going on right here in this state uh, with the expansion of, of the uh, labs, uh, lab work at Los Alamos, and you know, what's going on at Kirtland, uh, as well the Sandia labs. Uh, you know, th that's something to look at. So one, one issue is capitalism, and the other is its twin brother, imperialism. You know, like love and marriage? You can't have one without the other. Love and marriage. You cannot have capitalism without imperialism. 
Imperialism is the uh, external face of capitalism. At home, we impoverish and loot uh, our, own, our own citizenry. And abroad, we carry on massive warfare interventions. Um, it seems very likely now that there will be an attack, a major invasion of Pakistan. If you're reading the tea leaves in the last week, uh, they are on notice. The, uh, the representatives of the empire uh, were in Islamabad telling them in no uncertain terms, you know, you do what you want, what you want, or you know, you will face the consequences. Very clear what that means. Uh, this is what uh, Richard Armitage uh, in fact, told the Pakistani ambassador uh, when, after September 11th, he said the United States would bomb your country uh, back into the Stone Age if you don't cooperate with Washington. So the godfather, the Mafia Don, is in full regalia. Uh, he's, uh, U.S. troops are now operating in Uganda, Colombia, uh, Yemen, uh, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, the empire of bases is connected to the empire at home. And you read Panetta, read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times today. Panetta, who is the new Secretary of War, uh, has announced that uh, we cannot afford any budget cuts in the military, that uh, you know, we are faced by mu a mu multiplicity of threats, and that uh, Asia will be, we are going to stand our ground in Asia because we believe in the free movement of international shipping, and China is threatening that free movement of international uh, shipping. You know, I actually follow the news quite a bit. I know of no instance that the Chinese government has even vaguely alluded to the possibility of interfering with international commerce. So this is, again, a manufactured fear and then, you, of course, you can trot out the Iranians. I mean, they're like, you know, out, right out of um, central casting in Hollywood. And they're willing to play the part because they're, you know, run by a pretty idiotic uh, regime. Scare the Iranians, concoct this whole thing that, you know, the um, Saudi ambassador is going to get assassinated by a used car salesman in Houston. I mean, this was, again, this is beyond Saturday Night Live or anything Tina Fey could possibly do. But yet we were told this, this was a major threat. Uh, think about this, you know, the, uh, the Saudi ambassador, uh, you know, is representing a country which is arguably the most misogynistic, uh, the most uh, nepotistic, uh, regime and homophobic regime in the world today. It's, it's not even a country, it's a feudal dynasty. That's our great ally uh, in the Middle East, by the way. 15 of the 19 hijackers on September 11th were from Saudi Arabia. Not a single Afghan, not a single uh, Iraqi. The peoples who have paid the greatest price for that uh, particular uh, attack. So just, just think about that. Think about that relationship between Washington and Saudi Arabia. And when there is a re revolution in Saudi Arabia, mark my words, whoever is going to be Secretary of State at that time is going to announce to the American people that we have supported democracy and freedom in Saudi Arabia you know, more than anyone in the world. And it's, 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 beyond, it's beyond chutzpah, it's beyond parody, the level of hypocrisy, as Michael Parenti likes to say. You know, the United States doesn't make the world safe for democracy, it makes it safe for hypocrisy.